good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to all of you. Um, thank you for all the, of, uh, to those uh, who have joined already. Um, my name is Jorum Gerhard, um, the managing editor of Exploring Economics, uh, which is an e-learning platform for pluralism in economics. And more importantly, I'm part of uh, an amazing organizing team of this year's Summer Academy. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to welcome all of our participants again, um, our guests, and most importantly, Professor Adam Toos to this closing lecture of the Summer Academy. Before we start uh, with today's lecture and the discussion, I would like to give uh, our guests an idea of what we're actually doing here, um, of what we're doing at this online Summer Academy. Um, the Summer Academy is the fourth Summer Academy uh, for Pluralist Economics. Mm, for the past week, um, we have been working and studying together with 140 participants from over 40 countries. Um, these participants have been working in 12 different week-long workshops, mm, all of this in an online format. And at this point already, a massive thanks to the organizing team uh, behind the scene and also to our patient and uh, quite creative participants. The framework um, under which this Summer Academy for Pluralist Economics is running is mainstream economics sold out, ways into sustainable futures. So you might ask, why do we need a Summer Academy for Pluralist Economics? And, and that's what I just very shortly, briefly want to talk about before we go to Adam Toos. Um, our answer would be that it is quite straightforward. Um, we live in a world of multiple crises. Uh, one thing we are learning is that global integration may or does generate crises that are often not anticipated and uh, quite or deeply complex. Uh, something that Adam Toos has described in his uh, recent book very well as well. And on the one hand, um, this demands immediate action, e.g., for example, in the form of structures that can react quickly. Um, we have seen governments, central banks reacting very quickly and which was very important. But on the other hand, it also needs an open and fitting debate and, dis uh, and discussion to prevent such crises and to react in the right way. Um, yeah, when it comes mm, to the past and the current crises, the problem that uh, we and other scholars are observing is that the economic mainstream has proven to be too narrow uh, to deliver and has ignored too many crises uh, for too long. It has denied many structures such as governments as well the space to react or prevent crises and it has also fought against a more open debate in economics so we need a plurality of perspectives in economics and that is what we are practicing during this week um, on this quite simplistic slide you can actually see the 12 workshops uh, that are taking place still um, yeah, you can have a look through it. Um, topics uh, from decolonizing and diversifying economics, very important, over feminist economics to sustainable finance uh, and many more. Mm. Yeah, so these perspectives are very important. Mm. Very, sh yeah, very shortly, um, these perspectives are multiple perspectives to understand obviously multiple crises and multiple futures. There's not just one future. To come to the actual talk for today, um, we have some ground rules as uh, always uh, during this online session. We, we record and publish, publish the whole session. Um, this is important for you to know as we would love you to take part in the discussion later via video and audio if you would like to. And during Adam's lecture, you can already collect questions in the Q&A tool, which you'll find in the panel below or above your, your screen. And at some point, we'll give you the option to upvote questions. Uh, we will go through these questions. We will go through the most liked questions um, during the discussion. And we want to encourage one thing. Um, uh, since we have been taking a lot of different perspectives, of course, uh, uh, important looks at dependencies, um, inequalities on a global scale. Um, we want to encourage all workshops uh, to, to ask questions, obviously. Um, so don't be shy. Um, but coming to the topic for the day, um, you, can see, uh, you might see uh, Adam Tu's video already. He's, uh, he's here, which is really great. Um, today, we want to examine how the corona crisis um, or the COVID-19 shock is changing our world. Um, there are 
have been, for example, a number of taboos that are falling with an astonishing speed during this time. But the question is still, are we experiencing a global paradigm shift or, or rather a business as usual crisis? What, yeah, obviously the first question would be, what kind of crisis is this actually right now? And there are many more questions, but yeah, I'd say a very ambitious goal for tonight's discussion uh, would be that we can all um, better understand the global flows and connection underneath this crisis um, from Adam's uh, input, obviously but maybe also discuss whether we are moving towards an economics discussion that is up to this task, um, that is more diverse and that is more plural. Um, yeah, sounds like a big task, but uh, we do have Adam, Professor Adam Toos as our speaker today, um, which um, seems to be someone who, who is up to the task. Um, Professor Toos is an uh, economic historian and teaches at the Columbia University. He's also the director of the European Institute and a best-selling author. His latest book is Crashed, uh, a profound and uh, brilliant book that describes the last decade of financial crises and how this has changed the world. Um, and yeah, you might also be following recent debates, for example, on Twitter. And then you would know um, that his overview and his understanding of recent geoeconomics or the complex way of our world, how it is connected to not just through human interactions, but very importantly, through powerful and huge financial flows. Um, so with his overview of the debate, it, it seems to us here um, as a perfect fit for this closing lectures and the topic that you see in front of you on the screen. Um, yeah, Adam, we are incredibly lucky to have you um, with us. And we're very thankful that um, you support this, um, this academy, but also the whole initiative. Um, yeah, please. Go ahead and um, we'll stop sharing our screen and hand over to you. Oh, thank you, Joan, for that very kind introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Can you hear me okay? Is the, is the audio fine? Good. Um, it's really a, really a treat to be part of this discussion. Um, I, I, I'm particularly pleased because I like the title so much. Uh, uh, <laughs> it isn't one that I came up with either. Uh, this doesn't always happen. Um, but. Uh, but uh, through, through flaky incompetence on my part, I left the organizers with the job of organizing a title and they came up with an absolutely brilliant one, crisis as usual or something, or something new. Uh, and I love that because it starts from the premise that the normal state is one of crisis and then asks us to differentiate the current situation from that. And for a critical social theory, which I take to be one of the common interests of this group, that seems to me to be absolutely the right starting place. If you have a Marxist bone in your body, obviously, you believe this deeply, that normality is a condition of crisis. And I was delighted to see your layout, which placed Marxist political economy at the center of your, of your, of your colorful um, diagram. But I mean it to affirm it more concretely, more specifically, and more historically, because I, I am somebody trained in economics, but, but I, I think of myself first and foremost as a historian. And the conventional boxes with which we organize our grand narrative of economic history, which I think also inform the understanding of where we are of non-historians, if you think of the, the age of neoliberalism, which comes out of the crisis of the 1970s, which followed from what we sometimes call the golden age or the post-war growth period. If we think of the gold standard period before that, between the middle of the 19th century and 1914, these categories, these boxes, these ideas serve an extremely useful heuristic purpose, no doubt, but they are also profoundly misleading and they're profoundly misleading with precisely with regard to the framing of your question because they make crisis seem like the exception. Crisis is what happens between those periods, classically in the 1970s, for instance, or in the interwar period. It's a hiatus. And what they effectively do, therefore, is to, as it were, polarize, create a light and dark, a sense, as it were, of normality interrupted by crisis and then a new order, a new normality. And I think this is a very bad habit of thinking about economic history and therefore, broadly speaking, of economic dynamics and our contemporary reality as well. Take, for instance, the period that I think is very informative for, in fact, some particularly some branches of critical political economy, 
which is the period between 1945 and 1973. Think of the names that we give it. We give it the name, the post-war growth boom, for instance, or the Bretton Woods period, or the period of the KWS, the Keynesian welfare state is a label that many people use in political economy circles. Or more floridly, we call it the golden age, or in French, they call it the 30 glorieuses, the 30 golden years, the 30 glorious years. Does that framing make sense, really? Because what it would do, if it did, would imply there is a period where there's no crisis and then crisis comes after and then we have a new order. Well, first of all, you could ask, well, for whom? When? Where, precisely? For women in the aftermath of World War II who have systematically driven out of the labor market by returning men? For African-Americans in the Jim Crow South fighting the struggle of uh, civil rights through to the 1960s? For migrant workers in Europe? Clearly not. That chronology does not work well. It doesn't mesh with the chronology of decolonization either in any simple sense. But let's just for a second grant these terms and let's apply them to what they're intended to apply to, which is, as it were, a notion of a economic growth that is holistic and is the blind to this question of difference. Does it even make sense in that case? Think about one of the framing devices, the idea of the post-war period of economic growth. Post which war? Post World War II, sure, but only the beginning of the Cold War, a constant generator of violent crises all over the world. Think of the major colonial powers, still colonial powers at that point, Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, for crying out loud, the United States in its new role, all constantly involved in war and the wars are hot wars, Blood, shed is, blood is being shed and treasure is being shed. This is not a period of quiescence, perhaps for Germany, perhaps for Italy, but for and Japan, but that's a specific result of their experience. And they are, of course, at the front line of the Cold War. Think of the violence in the history of Latin America or Korea in this period. Does a post-war framing make sense for them? Clearly not. Take something that's more obviously economic. Take the notion of the Bretton Woods system, which anchors a huge amount of discourse about international economics and serves for many people still when you talk about things we would wish for would be a new Bretton Woods, a new moment when we sit down together and settle the order. And this fantasy, this desire stretches across the political spectrum from Yanis Varoufakis and David Adler and people like that in GM25 in Europe on the one hand, all the way through to WEF, Klaus Schwab and the Davos folks. They all yearn for this 1945 moment because they attach it to the Trump Glorios. It's a period that, in which there is no crisis, apparently. But then actually think of the monetary history of the world. The conference takes place in 1944, and it's immediately obvious that it's completely infeasible to apply any of its rules immediately. There was one attempt in 1947 by the richest and most powerful of the European states, not surprisingly the British Empire. It fails immediately. Then you have the crisis which tips America into the Marshall Plan. You have the Korean War crisis of the 1950s. The basic condition of a monetary order is the terms in which money can be exchanged. Convertibility is not established under the Bretton Woods rules between until 1957-58. By the early 1960s, the system is already under so much tension that they have to innovate swap lines, which are the tool that we resort to again in 2008 to shuffle a currency around the system to make it manageable. By 1967, America's already in the throes of the Vietnam War crisis, and it's pretty clear that the Japan and Germany have to revalue, otherwise the entire system will come apart. By 1971, Nixon kills Bretton Woods, and in 1973, Bretton Woods is buried. So exactly how long was the Bretton Woods period for? What is it that we're invoking when we're invoking this period of non-crisis that continues to serve as an anchor. I was astonished to read Nixon recently in the early 1970s, promising Americans in the early 1970s a new thing, a new thing which he called a post-war economy. He promised Americans in the 1970s, how? By ending the war in Vietnam and achieving detente with the Soviets and the Chinese. For what we think of now as the golden period of American growth in the 1950s and 60s appeared to Richard Nixon in the 1970s as a wartime economy. And the question was, America, could America exit that crisis, that permanent crisis? You could perform this act of deconstruction on all of those other chunks. Take the gold standard epoch, the 19th century period of non-crisis, born out of what? The Franco-Prussian War and massive reparations from France to Prussia immediately plunging the world into the deflation crisis of the 1870s, which spawns illiberalism, anti-Semitism, protectionism, the entire paraphernalia of dynamic late 19th century politics. 
triggers another huge recession in 1896, which almost takes the United States out of the gold standard. A second one in 1907, so serious the Americans have to invent the Federal Reserve System. And you don't have to be a Leninist to believe that this system of what Trotsky quite aptly called uneven and combined development, and what we euphemistically describe as globalization, might just possibly have had something to do with the outbreak of World War I in 1914. And since the era of the 1970s, well, we talk about the era of neoliberalism, the Washington Consensus, the market, market revolution. It's framed from 1989 onwards by that promise of unipolarity, America's absolute dominance in world affairs. Sure, but what is the actual history of what, you know, what one might call real existing neoliberalism, as opposed to the fantasy cookie cutter cooked up by somebody in Freiburg, for instance? What does it actually consist of? Well, you only have to go as far as Reinhardt and Rogoff ex-economists of the IMF to be told that it's basically a history of perpetual and continuous crisis. As soon as you liberalize financial markets, as soon as you liberalize foreign exchange movements, what will result is crisis. And that is really the warning of their, of their book of 2008-9, This Time is Different. Not really that this time is different, but nowhere is different. In other words, the crisis will reach everyone. And in 2008, it reached the core of the world economy. And that crisis then continued to burn on in the Eurozone, as we know, some would say, all the way down to the present day. But if crisis is the norm, then I think it's also worth saying that so too is scrambled improvisational solutionism one improvised fix after another. As you, as you know, if you've ever, ever studied even just the slightest hint of economic history, you'll know that if you look at the statistics of GDP stretched over the long run, and this is where I really should have a graph, and I have just a few slides to use later on, you'll know that broadly speaking, it just goes up in a straight line once you, once you make it, once you put it on the logarithmic graph, because it's an exponential curve growing at one and a half to two percent per annum. So if you put it on logs, it looks linear. But it is a relentless, massive growth machine. This is the other side of our reality. Crisis as a perpetual condition, but also improvised solution finding, growth, innovation, technological, institutional change, and the mobilization endlessly of new resources. In fact, if you adopt the right optic for a place that was relatively less troubled by politics and international relations crisis, take a neutral country like Sweden, Sweden's economic history looks like in logs, a straight line, broadly speaking. And so, but behind that, of course, is the tumultuous history of a modern increasingly industrialized country, the victory of a social democratic uh, state. So we have to, I think, deal with this reality of a continuous driving dynamic of growth counterposed to a continuous uh, uh, a norm of crisis and reconstruction. And that then poses the question, how against that backdrop, if that is, as it were, the right gestalt for thinking about how economies evolve over time, is how do we decide whether this crisis is unusual or new or, or different? And again, I think it's worth starting from a first principles kind of answer, which is to say that as a historian, my answer to that question is that each one of those crises and each one of those improvised fixes is new, each of them. And I mean that in the banal, I mean, sort of banal on the one hand, but also metaphysically deep sense of Heraclitus, who famously said that you can't put your feet in the same river twice, right? Real history moves uh, within this continuously. And I emphasize that, especially when talking to economists, because I think amongst economists, there's a tendency to think that crisis is actually something that you can easily generalize about. In other words, the sophisticated version of this are crisis theories, if, especially if you come out of a Marxist tradition, you'll be familiar with efforts to generalize, produce generalized accounts of how crises work. The dumb pop sci social psychology version of that impulse to generalize about the logic of crisis is the tulip analogy. So the tulip analogy is the uh, example of the famous craze for tulip bulbs, literally the flower bulbs in the Netherlands in the middle of the Thirty Years' War in 1637, 1638. And it's widely treated as the first instance of, well, this is the thing, not a historically specific moment of capitalist speculation in what potentially could have been an agricultural product, but the demonstration of the basic human impulse to excessive enthusiasm, animal spirits gone wrong, um, uh, a, a statement about human psychology rather than 
uh, uh, economics as such. And as a result, you will find that in discussions of economic change, railway stocks in the 1850s, the 1870s, and the 1890s were like tulips. Radios and new industries like the car in the 1920s, the drivers of the famous Wall Street boom of the 1920s, were like tulips. Emerging market shares and debts in the 1990s were like tulips. Dot com and the Silicon Valley bubble, which burst between 2000 and 2001. Again, the social psychology of exaggerated exuberance, excessive exuberance like tulips. And of course, all the way down to 2008 mortgage-backed securities. What was that? It was a speculative psychological dynamic in which people got too enthusiastic about something endlessly repeating. Now, this isn't to say that there isn't something, some element of social psychology of called excess involved in moments of speculation like that. But that is also the most banal element of what is going on there. Because after all, railway stocks are not like tulips and radios and modern industries of the 1920s are not tulips and nor are emerging markets. They're actually economic change. History is made in these recurring bouts of speculation. Transformative physical investment takes place that actually reshapes the infrastructure of the world and reshapes our possibilities with dramatic consequences for the Anthropocene. Um, what, is, what is shale after all, other than tulips? Well, clearly this is the most absurd and reductive way of describing it, but there is an element of the recent shale boom, which is clearly, you know, can be described by that logic. I often say it's a little bit, little bit like an aircraft crash investigator establishing, uh, spending months doing a profound investigation of a tragic accident and returning the verdict to the distressed families that it was probably gravity that was responsible for the airplane crash. Sure. Uh, there is excessive exuberance in moments like that. Schumpeter is our guide here, um, uh, even more attuned to technology writing in the late 19th century than the Karl Marx was uh, a few generations earlier. So if we start from a history, a genuine history of crises, stretching at the global level back to the early 19th century, let me try and answer this question. Is COVID a more dramatic, more general, more decisive, more epochal break than other crises, than normal? Is this a rupture with normality? That is the question. And I think the answer to that question is completely clear. It is indeed a rupture with normality. And let me try engage here in the somewhat tricky business of sharing my slides with you. Sorry. Are we good? So it's this one here that we need to focus on. This is this extraordinary graph produced by the World Bank uh, for one of its reports earlier in the year, which shows the percentage of economies around the world currently in recession. And you can see that uh, it reports that over 90% of economies across the world are currently in recession. That's greater even than the number of economies that were in recession in the 1930s. It's the single most capacious dramatic shock. And we, we all know why. It was the result of a deliberate action on the part of governments around the world, starting with China and ending in some sense symbolically, well, really you should say with Bangladesh, but with uh, Modi's decision to shut India down on March 24th. Um, that creates, for the first time in history, a closure of the vast majority of the world's labour markets. Uh, uh, we think that over 80% of the world's workforce was subject to one type or another of restriction. There's never been anything remotely like this before. There hasn't ever been a shock as savage as this. The rate at which GDP has been falling this spring is faster than ever before. If it were to continue, which it won't, it would be much deeper than the Great Depression of the 1930s. There's reasons to think it won't. The type of shock is different. It is, as I've said, absolutely deliberate shutdown. This is not, as many people rumoured, a warm time mobilisation. It is the closure of the entire economy. And it's the sexual differences that are so dramatic. As you all know, the standard driver of a business cycle is heavy industrial investment, construction. This is a closing down of the service sector. And as a result, it also affects an entirely different group of people. It affects women for the first time. So American economists have coined this. Uh, to my ears, extremely jarring phrase, the she session, which has the only redeeming feature that it features gender at the absolute heart of the description, because this is indeed the first major recession of its type in which women lose more jobs than men. It's a historic moment because last year, I believe, was the first year or perhaps the year before in which more women were in, in paid work than men in the United States. And there's a sort of ghastly irony, a dark irony in the fact that the next recession that should come along should also be the first that destroyed more women's jobs. 
than any recession before. One of the things which makes this recession like other recessions, but profoundly more savage, is that it victimizes the most vulnerable. It is a hugely inequality enhancing event. It's savaging the most uh, fragile in the labor market around the world. This is true in the advanced economies where we haven't had short time working like in the United States, where the loss of low wage jobs has been so severe that the average wage of those employed has leapt. So as you shed those with the least productivity and the lowest wages, the effect is to raise the average wage of those still in employment. It's an entirely perverse statistical effect. But the loss of jobs at the bottom end of the American labor market has been that severe. But far, far more grievous is, of course, the vulnerability of those in precarious employment in emerging so-called emerging markets, uh, the largest group of which are uh, the migrant workers in India who were basically thrown out of jobs in a, with a few hours notice on the night of March 24th, uh, but also the huge informal uh, labor markets of Latin America, uh, of sub-Saharan Africa, and in China as well, where tens of millions at least, probably more than 100 million migrant workers found themselves out of work in the first waves of shutdowns in February. So that is similar to other recessions, that it is massively inequality enhancing, but this is just devastatingly larger than any shock of its type that we've seen recently. But I want in the rest of today's talk to focus on three deeper reasons that I think mark this current crisis as a break. And just to orientate yourselves, I would say that these are the three. The first is that it marks the sudden dramatic arrival of the Anthropocene as a driver of comprehensive economic crisis. This is new. We could argue about whether Anthropocene is the appropriate term. You know what I mean in any case, even if you find the term problematic. In the climate change context, one might prefer the notion of capital as seen. Um, in this particular context, I think it's because it is the human body and literally everyone's body that is a potential vector of transmission. The Anthropocene actually has a kind of aptness that it doesn't perhaps when we're talking about massively unequal carbon emissions around the world. In any case, a natural blowback as a driver of systemic shock to the economy is novel in the modern period. In fact, many people would have defined the modern period precisely by the fact that it was no longer natural shocks that perturbed our economies. This is what distinguishes us, say, from the 18th century. An amazing statistic that the shock to the British economy right now in the second quarter of 2020 is the most severe since 1713. Now, Britain is unusual in having very long GDP series, but what happened in 1713? No modern economic historian had it top of stack. It turns out it was a terribly cold winter in 1712, 1713, which caused harvest failure and famine. And it's one of the last big famines in Western Europe is 1713. This was brought back to mind in 2020 because we now confront a shock also driven by a natural feedback loop uh, that is as severe as that. The second general shift, which I think makes 2020 different, is that after the emerging market crisis of the late 1990s, which had a profound and often underestimated impact on the political economy of the emerging markets, and after the deep financial crisis of the North Atlantic system in 2008, 2020 marks the collapse of a certain paradigm of economic policy. Whether it marks the end of neoliberalism, we can talk about and the hope we'll talk about, but it certainly marks a further phase in the slow and gradual attrition of that policy paradigm. And the third point that I'm going to emphasize is that we're witnessing in a dramatic form the way in which global economic development, both in international economics and domestic governance, has the, has the ability, not only, as it sometimes does, of course, to constantly entrench global inequality and to reinforce core periphery relationships and to spawn that way of even talking about them. It also has the capacity under certain conditions to challenge, disrupt familiar hierarchies and indeed blow them apart, to reshuffle the global pack. And living and working and thinking in America as I do, there's no doubt at all that the United States and its governing elite are currently going through a profound crisis of confidence with regard to their ability to manage the global system, as they presume they've been able to do at least since the end of the Cold War. So let me just, in the rest of my talk today, address those three points and dig a little deeper. Since the 1970s, um, environmental economists, let me see if 
um, an environmental analyst have been insisting that the um, development of modernity and the dynamics of the global economy have a systemic impact in shifting the parameters of the envelope within which humanity lives. And the context in which we're familiar with this most often, I think, certainly were at the beginning of 2020, was the climate change paradigm and the understanding of the feedback loop from CO2. If you go back to the environmental writing of the early 1970s, the famous Club of Rome report of 1973 unfolds this across a whole variety of resources and points to both environmental envelope concerns and resource extraction. The effect of the COVID impact on me, certainly as somebody coming out of the political economy realm, was to force me to go back to the 1970s and look at a different literature, which is the literature of what's called the emerging infectious diseases paradigm. And the astonishing, to me astonishing thing, is that it runs completely parallel with the conversations about the Anthropocene driven by natural resource, resource extraction or climate type stories. In other words, from the 1970s, medics began to think very seriously about the way in which humanity's consumption and mobilization of natural resources also tended to generate mutations in viruses, which made us then the victims of our own success in extracting more resource from nature. Um, this is by now, I think, for all of us thinking people going through this crisis, a commonplace. Um, it wasn't top of stack when I was thinking about the Anthropocene at the beginning of the year, but this is the Wall Street Journal from the day before yesterday. So this is the house newspaper of the American, of American capital, of American business, buying lock, stock and barrel the entire argument of the emerging diseases paradigm, much more, I think, unproblematically than they buy the climate story. In other words, this is recognized as a logic that really, really bites. The two things, the two, the story of the climate politics and the story of the emerging diseases paradigm run incredibly closely together. The first intergovernmental conference at which climate was discussed was in November 1989, in which, as it were, active policy was considered between the Japanese, the Europeans and the Americans with the Soviets there. 1989 is also the Rockefeller University conference at which the emerging diseases paradigm is first launched as a major area of research. Think about it as a reflex of the AIDS crisis of the 1980s. And American university academics and global scientists are trying to figure out what the hell is going on, where this killer disease came from and what they're going to do about it. And then think about the coincidence of this. The climate conference breaks up, I think on the 4th or the 5th of November and on the 8th, 9th of November, the Berlin Wall falls and the Cold War ends. And Naomi Klein, the great climate activist, has formulated this very neatly in saying that one of the great tragedies of humanity is that the problem of the Anthropocene and the problem of climate and the problem of the entanglement of capitalism with the development of, de of environmental destabilization emerged precisely at the moment at which the neoliberal paradigm became hegemonic. One of the other effects of this moment after 1989 and then rumbling into the 90s and then even more after 9-11 is that the climate discourse driven very much by political economy and the emerging diseases paradigm separate paths because the emerging diseases paradigm is increasingly monopolized by bioterrorism. It's treated as a security problem or it's treated as a development problem. In other words, it's about vaccine equity. It's about addressing uh, diseases of poverty, but the two are not formed together as a single package for thinking about how we understand the challenges of the Anthropocene in the way that you might expect. And they both come up against the brick wall of neoliberalism as a constraining set of assumptions about what we can do. And if you want, as it were, symbols of that, think about the endless monotonous debate about carbon pricing, and the possibility of putting a price on CO2. And on the other hand, the extraordinary innovation of the pandemic bond. The pandemic bond and carbon pricing are to me, as it were, limit cases of the ability of the neoliberal paradigm to handle the recognized and increasingly acknowledged, but incoherently analyzed consequences of the Anthropocene. And then COVID struck. And all of a sudden, at the beginning of 2020, we were confronted with the fact that the Anthropocene was not going to simply be an attritional struggle, which of course it remains, but something that demands responses on the timeline, not of months or years, not Greta Thunberg's 12 year timeline that had freaked us all out, let's face it, that was fast enough, but actually requires a response at the level of days, if not hours, ideally, 
Um, and that was a, 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 a framework for thinking about the challenge of the Anthropocene that was a security framework, absolutely. And people who had been in the front line of Evola fully understood the need for absolutely urgent action, but that was not the way um, the Anthropocene was being conceived within the political economy sphere. And then we had to act. And then we had to act and we had to act fast. And what's astonishing to my mind is that of all of the different facets of the crisis response to COVID, if you think about the public health dimensions, decisions about schooling, education, labor market, and so on, the bit that moved fastest in a telltale way was in fact the economic policy response. The economic policy response in its early phases anyway was relatively consensual. It was top down, it was massive, unprecedented in its scale. And people had a sense that they knew what they were doing and one has, I think, to ask why that is. And of course, the answer is, is that the neoliberal frame, which was constraining our response to the Anthropocene, when that crisis turned into a comprehensive crisis of the financial markets, exposed the fact that we already know that it's dead. In other words, we already know what we're going to do next. We already have another toolkit in place that we can use because we already used that toolkit in response to the late 1919 crisis in the emerging markets and even more dramatically after 2008. The one lot of people who confronted with the crisis of March knew what they were going to do next were the central bankers. Virtually everyone else was basically navigating in the dark. One of the reasons that the central bankers sort of had an idea of where they were going to go is that they, in fact, had already begun to think about the way in which the Anthropocene would impact on their operations, but they'd begun to do it by way of climate. And the way in which this happened is the discourse many of you will be familiar with, which is the green financial discourse, transparency, disclosure, and the model of the green or the climate Minsky moment, which the Bank of England analysis and the high profile Mark Carney as the governor of the Bank of England started promoting from 2015 onwards. And the fascinating thing about this is it's holistic. So the argument is a climate crisis will spill over into the financial system and force us as regulators and managers of the financial system to act. Even more interesting is the way in which the causal chain works. Because the idea is not that a hurricane will upset Lloyd's insurance markets enough to cause the Bank of England to act. It's more systemic than that. The idea is, is more like Fukushima and Angela Merkel in 2011. In other words, something really bad happens in the climate. And then a group of politicians at the last minute, having denied the problem for years, because in part we've made it so difficult for them to address it, suddenly have to address it at a holistic level. And that causes a massive revaluation of assets and that forces us to intervene. And of course, this is the way in which the climate Minsky moment was forced. It was the so-called transition risks, which are risks resulting from policy adopted to change attitude towards climate. That's exactly which what, what we are facing in the spring of 2020, but not of course triggered by climate, but triggered by something even more urgent and even more compelling in its logic. So the proposals of extinction rebellion in the UK to shut Heathrow down, which were dismissed in 2019 as suicidal nonsense and kind of anti-politics that was about death rather than constructive politics, are literally what we're all doing. And it's not just governments, we're not getting in the airplanes anymore. And the central bank had a way of responding to this crisis, which was to a degree already road mapped. And you know, the reaction has been huge, of course, I don't need in an audience like this to explain the scale of the monetary policy response. We have seen liquidity support on a scale even larger than in 2008, uh, or we'll see, we've seen fiscal policy responses as well. We have also, in Europe, seen innovative steps in July and the July compromise, which many of us, I think, in March or April would have considered extremely unlikely. It's an instance in which we actually might be witnessing people learning from history in a constructive direction. And that's not to be naive. I've written critically about that compromise, but it's different from what happened in 2010. We've also seen in the United States a massive backdrop, uh, backstop extended to private credit, to corporate credit, much more ambiguous in its impact, highly criticized by many people on the left because of its distributional implications. The Fed is effectively bailing out some of the highest earning people. And they're not even in Wall Street. We're talking hedge fund people who live in Connecticut. They don't earn bankers' salaries. They earn hedge fund salaries. They earn hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars a year trading in high yield, high risk debt. Those are the people who had to be bailed out this time because the markets had to be stabilized. And that is uh, fundamental to enabling the fiscal policy response to go forward. But to really understand why the Fed in particular has acted in the way that it has this March, you have to dig a little deeper 
to realize and to plumb the depths of the crisis that we hit in March. And this hasn't exactly been buried. It hasn't exactly been hidden. It isn't a secret what I'm going to be talking about in just a second, but it has really slid out of the spotlight. And yet, if you want to understand why the Fed was literally buying a million dollars of assets a second every single day in late March, that adds up to $80 billion a day a day of purchases. That's what Ben Bedanke was doing in a month in 2008. Why were they doing that? You have to understand the severity of this crisis in March. Um, so let me just take a, a second uh, to, to spell that out for you. What was happening in March was extremely, extremely worrying. There was, of course, everyone could see it, the COVID crisis coming. People were gonna die, hundreds of thousands, if not millions. There was the lockdown coming in prospect. There was the looming economic recession that would follow from that. All of that would be enough to freak financial markets out, fine. There is also, as many of you will know, a huge mountain of corporate debt hanging over the world economy. Many of it, much of it quite high risk, much of it in the emerging markets, some of it in dollars, quite a lot of it in dollars, a huge overhang of risk. All of that was worrying the world's financiers. And the way in which they shield themselves from that is to run into other assets. Because if, you're, if you've got a trillion dollars to dispose of, the dirty secret of your problem is that you've got to invest it somewhere. You can't actually keep it in cash. So you've got to put it into something. And so if those other assets are becoming risky, what you need to do is to find somewhere to put it. And what is terrifying about March 2020 is that that escape route into something safer is closing. And the collective search for that escape route is causing a truly disturbing event. The standard escape route for investors in an emergency like that, and it may come as something that's a little bit difficult to swallow because it's counter to our intuitions, is government debt. The thing that you run into are government debts. Why? Because they're secured by political commitments and they're secured by tax revenue. And that's not an income stream on a particular company. That's a tax exacting on the entirety of GDP. And the debt that you run into, again, this may be slightly counterintuitive, is American debt. Not because it's the safest, because you'd probably rather be in Swiss and German, but because it's huge. It's a vast market, trillions of dollars, 10 trillions plus. The beauty of that is that if you in particular want to sell yours, there's almost certainly going to be somebody else who'll buy it. In other words, it's very deep and a very liquid market. And that is the normal course of things. And in February, as panic built, that's what happened. So treasury prices go up and yields go down, which means the interest rate goes down. The American government can issue more debt. Everyone's happy. That's what we've seen since April. As you'll know, interest rates now are close to zero, even for American debt, unheard of. For German debt, they're negative. With lots of debt borrowers around their worth, they're negative. The terrifying thing that was happening in March is that that standard logic was inverting. Between March 9th and March 23rd of this year, um, that model broke down. And this is the UK market, which I'm citing because it's particularly sharp, and it's also the oldest big public debt market in the world. So it happening here was particularly freaky. What happened in March um, 2020 in the sovereign debt market scared, it's, I, I mean, I've been only this morning speaking to a fixed income guy from JP Morgan, in their entire careers and in the history of that bank, they have never seen a shock like the one that we saw in Treasury, UK Treasuries, US Treasuries, and even in the bond market in March. What was happening is that hard pressed funds of various types were desperately looking for liquidity. When you're looking for liquidity, what you sell is the thing that most people want to buy. It turns out in a crisis like this, everyone simultaneously wants to sell their gold. Everyone wants to sell their silver. Everyone is simultaneously trying to sell their most precious thing. And the consequence of that is that even your most precious thing suddenly threatens to become worthless. And so in March, treasury prices, rather than going up and interest rates going down, which is what you'd expect in a normal panic, all of a sudden, treasury start, prices started falling. Now, normally, in a market like this, there are big, solid, fortress balance sheets like JP Morgan, who say, oh, this is amazing. I can actually buy US treasuries at prices this low. I'll have them. I'll put them on my balance sheet and sell them to somebody else two months from now when we're all back to normal and make a huge profit. They weren't there. They weren't there because bank, uh, businesses were pulling down credit lines from the banks. The banks themselves needed credit. And because of the banking regulations of 2008, which worked very well, the banks are actually restricted in the amount of assets they can pile on their balance sheet. So they weren't there. 
And then on top of that, we had a group of hedge funds who were playing one of the most vanilla plays in the bond market, where you look for fractional, tiny, minute differences between treasury prices and futures, which is a tiny fractional profit game. People compare it to picking up you know, pennies. like It's like homeless people picking up cigarettes off the street. That's how you make your money in this business. The way you do it, like people who collect cans, is you collect all of the cans on the street. And if you do that, you can make substantial money making this safe trade. For that, you need leverage. That leverage is financed through the repo market. And then we understand what happens next. The hedge funds were offloading in the order of 600 billion worth of treasury into this market. And that's why you get this extraordinary fluctuation. Now, the numbers on the left-hand side are the interest rates. So in Britain, um, it goes from 0.6 to 0.1 well, one, and then bobs back up to 0.8. Now, those are tiny interest rates. This is literally 0.1 of a percent, but that interest rate moves from 0.1 to 0.8. That's an eight-fold interest rate increase over a matter of hours. That is savage for the people holding those portfolios. This is the dark secret of what was happening in March. This is why the Federal Reserve steps in and says, we'll buy anything. If you want to sell your treasuries, we are the buyer of last resort. And if you want to unload literally a million dollars of these previously utterly precious gold bar equivalent treasuries a second, a million a second, we'll take them. And this is what the treasury was doing on an absolutely huge scale um, in, this, in this moment. One way more, it's like gravity stopped working. And you might say, well, gravity stopped working. It only stopped working for a fraction of a second. But just imagine if gravity stopped working for just a fraction of a second. How much of reality would you expect to fall back into place after gravity stopped working? All of it, buildings, uh, everything just floated in the wrong direction. And what the Fed did and what the central, central banks did is to tie everything back down to Earth through massive purchases. What that's enabled is the unprecedented surge in fiscal spending that we've seen since, seen since April. So we have seen the largest increase in debt since World War II, um, flat out. And we have seen interest rates fall at the same time. That shouldn't happen under neoclassical premises. It shouldn't be possible to issue the largest quantity of debt in the world, $11 trillion worth of debt, and have interest rates fall to zero for all of the high-end borrowers. Of course not for stressed emerging markets. This is a brutal Darwinian process. If you're Argentina, Lebanon, Ecuador, your interest rates are going the opposite direction. But if you're Malaysia and Indonesia, you're tracking down with the advanced economies towards zero. Uh, I think Malaysia is borrowing at 2% now, uh, Indonesia at 2%. These are rates they've never, ever been able to borrow at before in their entire post-colonial histories. So the world is separating into the winners and the losers, and the number of people that can borrow at incredibly low interest rates is, is, is massive right now. So you might say, OK, this is surely the end of the old dispensation. This is the opposite of austerity. And once this gets going, surely this is going to build constituencies. This is going to change the world. We're going to build infrastructure. You're going to build collectives of social interests and political parties interested in higher spending. This is the end of the old dispensation for sure. But I think one of the, one of the takeaways that I would offer is that uh, we should be careful about jumping to that conclusion. Remember what happened in 2008-9? There was huge spending then, and austerity comes later. The austerity argument begins in 2010. Paul Krugman has a great column where he says, he simply says it all went wrong in 2010 because that's when the political argument engages. In America, it's come even more quickly. We are literally witnessing right now the refusal of the Republican Party in US Congress to issue a new stimulus effort for the 20 to 30 million Americans who are unemployed. So their unemployment checks are all collapsing, but for the intervention of the merciful King Trump, who is using an executive order to extend them in an ad hoc way. Do not be surprised if the austerity backlash begins in Europe as well uh, uh, from the, all the usual sources. And to my mind, it isn't so much the conservatives per se who are the ones to worry about because they're very easy to spot and their arguments are transparent. What you really need to worry about are the Trojan horses of austerity, the sensible talk about things like sustainability. That's where the austerity backlash will begin. The horrible segue, especially popular in Germany, between the environmental discourse of sustainability, Nachhaltigkeit, intergenerational equity, and fiscal problems, as though they were the same sort of problem. And obviously, recycling sustainability and intergenerational equity is good when you're talking about climate, and so it clearly must be good about debt too. This is an argument to resist uh, frontally. Uh, 
do not underestimate Europe's ability for surreal acts of technocratic madness. Janis Varoufakis did us all a huge service recently by pointing out in The Guardian that in some bit of the European bureaucracy no one's been paying any attention to, they've just crafted a new debt plan for Greece, which requires it to go back to primary surplus next year. This is a, this is a suicide note for uh, the Euro European economy. For me, faced with this reality, the best hope is in fact the pressure of the factual, of the real. Uh, it may be possible for European technocrats to dream up a plan by which Greece returns to fiscal uh, stability next year. Um, from the point of view of Italy, this is just poppycock. It's not happening. And if it were attempted, it would be a both political and financial disaster. So let us move, let me move in the final section of my talk to imagining an alternative reality. Let's imagine one in which we do not return to austerity. What sort of a world would that bring us? What sort of a rupture would 2020 mean if we regard it from that point of view? And I think for me, this is where we engage with the question of neoliberalism and what we mean by its end. For me, neoliberalism is framed above all in its classic historic form by a sociological struggle, by a class struggle, by a background of forces shaped in the 1970s and 80s, broadly speaking, by the confrontation between organized labor, employers, and the state. That is what the problem, that was the problem that neoliberalism was designed to fix. What worries me about simply concluding that because we're now doing gigantic fiscal policy with adventurous monetary policy to match, and we don't care about intervening in the economy, therefore neoliberalism is over, that to me seems blind to the question of what the underlying social forces, what the underlying balance of political forces in the current moment are. And that I think is what worries me about one possibility in the current situation, which again, you can see coming from the United States context, which is that if you break open constraint, if you break open the limits of what is acceptable, the question that you have to ask is, who does what with the agency that results? Obviously, interested as we are in progressive politics, as Joram said, we want to assert that another reality is possible. But the virtue of doing that depends on whether you assume that it's you who are going to be determined what that reality is going to be. And the, this is a, a, a problem that haunts MMT, it haunts Keynesian economics. The people who most completely realized Keynes's vision of a controlled economy in the 1930s were not the Brits and not the New Deal, but Nazi Germany. Um, they were the people who actually exploited the potential of that agency to its height. So the question I think we have to ask ourselves in the present conjuncture is who will benefit from a rupture if a rupture comes? Could we perversely find ourselves in a nightmare scenario, nostalgically remembering the good old days of neoliberalism, when the sort of crass authoritarian nationalist economic policy that we could very well envision in a Turkey, in a Hungary, but now also very clearly in the United States, was ruled out by the norms of proprietary. And it is, of course, a reality in the current moment that by far the most sophisticated, integrated, self-consciously activist, interventionist, multidimensional, economic policy in the world that thinks also about the energy question and sustainability is the one being pursued by Beijing in support of a profoundly authoritarian, violently repressive regime whose ideologues now openly espouse the ideas of the primacy of politics and sovereignty uh, derived from Carl Schmitt. The legal advocates of the current regime in Beijing are avid readers of Carl Schmitt. Now, I don't mean to, by saying that, to say that they're the same by any means. That's a ridiculous, that's a tulips type argument. It's a silly argument. Nor do I mean by that to deny the extraordinarily real and spectacular social and economic achievements of the Communist Party led uh, economic program in China. The whole point is to emphasize how real they are and how significant the consequences of those achievements are. And that's what brings me to my final point, which is what I'll end on, which is geopolitics. What we, what we have to come to terms with in the world, not just in the United States, is that the center of hard power, the people with the nuclear weapons, the people with the, battle, the, the fleets of aircraft carriers, the people who have perpetrated large scale war across the world since the 1990s in Washington DC, the security policy establishment, the Pentagon, the CIA, the NSA, and the associated think tanks, 
are going through a crisis-driven reassessment of the implications of economic growth for American power. That is the reality in Washington, D.C. right now. And it has been since 2014, and it is not limited to the Trump administration. And you should not expect that reassessment to end if Biden is elected. One of the basic unspoken assumptions of the neoliberal era was that economic growth was geopolitically neutral. The effects of growth were benign in that they would maybe change the regime of America's authoritarian antagonists. US preponderance was in any case so massive that whatever their economic growth could be, it could make no difference. Nothing could basically happen to change that fundamental framework. And you see this extraordinarily well illustrated in this notorious quote from Alan Greenspan made famous by Wolfgang Strake, who picked it out of the Zurich Daily Tagesanzeiger in which asked before the 2008 election which side he would vote for. Alan Greenspan, the former chair of the Fed, said it didn't really matter. Of course, Alan Greenspan's a conservative and didn't just really want to say, I'm going to vote for McCain. But his response was, it didn't matter. It didn't matter how he voted because we're fortunate that thanks to globalization, policy decisions in the US have been largely replaced by global market forces. National security aside, it hardly makes any difference who will be the next president. The world is governed by market forces. This is the classic assignment between the non-political, which is the economic, which is governed by globalization on the one side, and the residuum of politics, which is national security. Now, the, uh, the assumption behind that is that the two are no longer linked, right? Because if they were linked, then obviously you would actually have to consider the impact of one on the other. And what has happened in the last 20 years is that that separation has collapsed. And what we have to come to terms with is that the American hard policy establishment is souring on neoliberalism. Now, that is a very complex thing to say, because the American military establishment has never been desperately keen on neoliberalism in some respects. It's a welfare state. The only people who have a national health service in, the Amer in America are veterans. So they have a, a welfare organization. They also have a military industrial complex. They've always done industrial policy. Um, on the other hand, they are also what's called the camo economy. They are also drivers of outsourcing, of contracting, uh, of a global privatization of public services, which is very significant. So what I mean by saying that the American security policy establishment, the hard power people, the men and women with guns are souring in neoliberalism is not so much that as the general vision of a world unified by market forces of the type that Alan Greenspan is talking about. They are no longer willing to allow economics to be left to the economists. From the point of view of the hard power people in America, the economy is no longer safe in Alan Greenspan's hands. This is a, or, and the hands of the likes of him. And this is a very fundamental shift that we, that we, have, to, that we have to come to terms with. I'll just wrap in like, uh, I'll just wrap in, 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 in two minutes. So I've diagnosed, if you like, a fundamental set of challenges at the level of the Anthropocene, at the level of the shift in the framework of economic policy, and at the level of international relations, and at the level of hard power. And I'm setting out that framework because, as I started out by talking about, we need to consider crises at all different dimensions. And in the classic theories of radical political economy, back to the age of John Hobson and, and Lenin in the period before 1914, those elements are all linked together in various ways. And we are now confronting a moment in which they are all kaleidoscopically overlapping in a very dramatic way. The, way, the virus itself is being weaponized. The question of Americans' ability to control the virus is itself part of the grand political struggle. And the, the doings of tech firms are already of massive concern to the Pentagon and the NSA. So we are seeing a huge entanglement of forces here. Now the question is what is, what is it that I'm trying to tell you with by saying this? Because if in the tradition of radical political economy, there is a tradition of crisis theory. And if you go back to the 1970s, if you look at John O'Connor, if you look at Jürgen Habermas and legitimation crisis, they are outlining ways in which they believe the system is going to break down comprehensively. And Wolfgang Strake in his Adorno lectures took up that challenge in the wake of 2008 and the Euro crisis and offered us two books, um, Buying Time, um, and on the other hand, How Will Capitalism End? And that is a legitimate extension of that classic tradition of crisis theory, which says, here is the central flaw. This is how the system must come apart. Let me show you how that happens. And you can imagine, given the way that I started with this much more blurry vision of a continuum between crisis improvisation and continuation, that that isn't the way that I'm going to end. 
what I'm not, what I'm showing you within this crisis, I hope, is not, as it were, the logic of the final explosion, like also Kladerach, as the Germans would say, what German Marxists expected in the late 19th century, when everything would blow apart and the revolution would come. That doesn't seem to me a helpful way of thinking about this. In terms of the social theoretic traditions, which I think are useful for us at this moment, I recently re revisited All Respects book, Risk Society, came out in 1986 in the Chernobyl moment. A fantastically interesting account, precisely it seems to me, of the breakdown of those kind of classic categories and the need to think our world as one as constant, self-reflexive improvisation and forward movement. And that's why I think one should uh, welcome the activities of a group like yours, because it's precisely that kind of forward directed post classical uh, tradition, uh, mobilization of multiple different strands in the current conjuncture that you're engaged in. And, and heaven knows there is enough to work on. Another way of describing our current crises is that all of the major sectors of capitalism simultaneously find themselves in crisis. I've spoken about the financial sector. Um, we've spoken about uh, very briefly about the manufacturing supply chains, which have all suddenly shut down and uh, thrown hundreds of millions of people into unemployment. Um, we could talk about the energy sector. We were in an extraordinary moment in April this year in which the carbon price in Europe had reached a meaningful level of about 30 euros per ton and the price of oil in Oklahoma was negative. That is not a conjuncture that anyone ever imagined. We have the tech sector the great alibi of American capitalism, the thing that makes everyone feel good about capitalism is the iPhone. What a marvelous you know, gift to humanity, um, finding itself entrenched and ensnared in the geopolitical struggles with China in a way that we've never seen before. And think about the one sector which is here supposedly to save us, pharmaceuticals, the great vaccines race, one of the great massive industrial sectors of the world, billions of dollars throwing through it, and a profound question of legitimacy more starkly posed than probably ever before. What are the terms under which you will put your services at the disposal of humanity? How much do we have to flipping pay you to solve this problem for us? Are you seriously going to ask us to pay that price? That is not a question that any capitalist sector ever wants to face. And there was an extraordinary moment in April this year in which the people who told them that were none other than BlackRock. BlackRock informed the leading pharmaceutical companies of the world that BlackRock could not recommend that its money and the money that it manages for other people go into pharmaceuticals if they could not address this political risk. That political risk is the terms under which we find the vaccine that gets us out of this crisis. Now, another way of answering your question is that, again, is radical. To see all of those sectors simultaneously, finance, manufacturing, energy, tech, pharma, all suddenly simultaneously facing fundamental questions, separate, distinct, of course, but converging in this moment, that's another way of answering the question whether or not this is just a normal crisis. And I think it's clear that it isn't. Thank you very much for your patience. Adam, thanks so much. Um, I will give our participants and our audience um, just a little bit more time to, to upvote some of the questions. Um, obviously, the, the newer questions are still very much on the bottom, so I really encourage you to have a look at this. Um, while you do that, um, I can thank you, first of all. Um, that was uh, very much, I think, something that is, I could even say, missing here at our Summer Academy at the moment. Um, the, the historic perspective, um, we as the, yeah, exploring economics or the Netzwerk for Plural Economic, obviously also always say in the studies of economics, you need this perspective much more. Um, you need to think, as you uh, said, there are a few real world implications, but most importantly, you also included quite a lot of warnings. So really like that you started with that um, and then move over to uh, what we are doing today and uh, what we would be doing yeah. in the future. One little tip really for you on that count. And I, I would never demand that you all become historians or even insist that you must know huge amounts of history. But if you're ever using a data set, ask yourself about the timeline. Ask yourself about the framing. Don't be one of those economists who just uses a data set from 1990 to 2010 because you happen to be able to find it online and that's the data that's covered. Don't be one of those economists who starts their time series for the interest rate in 1981 and then discovers that there's a pronounced downward trend. 
right? You know, be smart about the way, just that that very, it's all about craft, like just, it's handbeckless, just think about the way in which history enters around the edges. It's not a question of like inserting it into some big grand narrative. It's actually just being conscious of the way it's there in an unacknowledged form. It, it's present, the timeline, but it's often simply not reflected on. You'll find so many studies of growth dynamics and so on that just simply start whenever the data theories start. <laughs> you know? and, and the research logic of that is obvious, but you're all you know, econometricians enough to realize you know, that that exposes you to an incredible fragility. Because what if you just had 10 more years of data um, and knew something about the narrative that would allow you to decide that 1981 would be an absolutely appalling moment to start your your time series for interest rates from because it's the world's historic high you know so um it's really that would be my modest plea is that when you engage in any kind of empirical analysis as an economist just ask yourself the significance about the starting date in your data yeah. and by itself that is a huge win okay yeah um hope i hope a lot of uh, econometricians are listening um Okay, let me see if I'm still on mute. No, I'm not on mute. But um, I would ask you, Adam, maybe for the discussion, uh, you can just uh, stop the screen share again. Um, yeah. Sorry, of course. Yeah. No, there's um, no uh, worries. We, uh, okay, well, while you do that, we will, um, as I already said in the beginning, uh, ask some of you if, if you want to uh, post your question live. Um, and it is live streamed on YouTube, so you can watch yourself afterwards, which I think a lot of people like doing. <laughs> I don't. Um, the first question, and it's something when I was envisioning the ideal Q&A uh, afterwards, which obviously never happens, but I thought it would be great to start with, with a bigger question of the paradigm again, because it's a big question that we ask here at the, the Summer Academy. Um, the old paradigm is looking quite tired. Um, I would ask, Andreas, um, Andreas Dimmelmeier, mm, if you would want to unmute, uh, maybe even show your video to ask your question yourself. Okay, I think it looks like, yes. Uh, yes, hello, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, fascinating uh, lecture and didn't expect anything else, but the question I would have a little bit is just, a, it sounds a little bit like a dry academic question, but it's, I think it also can tell us perhaps a little bit if we clarify here about the policy way forward. And one would be, you mentioned a very distinct paradigms like neoliberalism, but also something like, uh, I think the health governments or, or, or between kind of environmental and, and health issues. And the way you understand this, is this a purely ideational thing like, in the, the Kuhnian name giver thing, or then in the, the kind of policy paradigm literature from Hall, but also going down the what is the 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 element of um, sort of policy instruments, expert communities, data sets that are built up to to kind of put this paradigm into place. So if you could elaborate on that, and the second one would be I found it interesting how you construct the kind of the concept of the crisis. In, in the Bretton Woods period, but then again, we were hearing a lot about crisis, which I wasn't super sure was, was it about, is a recession a crisis? Is there a distinctness between a slow burning and a fast crisis, between an exogenous natural systems crisis and a financial crisis? Just to have your thoughts on this would be really fascinating. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's, that, those are, those are um, very heavy, serious questions. Um, I don't think I'm that keen on the notion of a paradigm, to be honest. Um, especially, especially one that was that 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 was purely ideational. I don't really. I think it's a long time since I've engaged with Kuhn, but I wouldn't necessarily think of Kuhn either as being purely ideational, is it? I mean, in the sense that it's also part of a practice of normal science, and you go on doing the experiments, and you end up finding again and again and again the results. That so there's a the kind of routine activity. As you would, as, as you'd probably expect, given my kind of effort to destabilize the, the, the boundary between the order and the crisis periods, I actually tend to be, find it more convincing to think of a kind of continuous evolution, a constant struggle going on. Um, um, and so I'm, I'm not, you know, the, the idea of a paradigm which then poses the, the question of when the paradigm is dramatically ruptured, that, that just doesn't seem to me to be, well, it's a heuristic, and I can understand why for certain analytical purposes you might want to use that. It doesn't seem like a terribly um, 
interesting way of thinking about the problem. I mean, I, you know, I'm kind of, as the Germans would say, vorbelastet, because I, 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 you know, I trained in Cambridge in the 1980s with the last generation of post-Keynesians who'd actually known, like, when I started at King's, Khan was still there. Um, so, like, you know, you were within touching distance of that founding generation, and the hagiographical kind of fixation on that that generation of geniuses that broke the paradigm was so overwhelming that it, you know, made me go off and run a, write a big book about stat statisticians who do descriptive statistics and change the world by counting things, right? Because so that's that is the way that I tend to think about the way in which knowledge shifts, and. And that is going on all the time. And I was talking to this JP Morgan guy this morning and he was saying, it's so weird this time around. It's almost like we've already got the game plan, you know, and then something happens like the bond market incident that really totally isn't in the 2008 script, but there is learning going on. I mean, the, the counterintuitive thing about that is that we sort of looked at each other and laughed. It's like, are we saying that we actually learned something? And, and I think it's actually possible that we did about how macro finance works. And the intersection, I mean, don't underestimate it, like the intersection between folks that you would think of, I hope, is like radical, Daniel Lagarbo and people like that, and the open-minded folks at the BIS and open-minded folks at people like JP Morgan, is like, it's seamless. It's completely seamless. The conversation goes back and forth. Everyone needs to understand how repo markets function and you don't, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna stop talking to somebody because she's Daniela. Like if she understands how this thing works, they wanted to speak to her. <laughs> like, so, you know, it's really, it's quite, it's, it's more like a blob uh, with some of the connotations of the blob, you know, when we think about foreign policy in the US, it's more amorphous, it's also more entangling than that, right? Because at what point does your conversation with JP Morgan change into something else? Um, but there is this desperate, and it's driven by the practicalities of, of, of certain very urgent tasks of stabilization. So there is a premise there, of, as it were, downplaying the conflictual element and foregrounding the element of the common interest in stability, which is pretty easy to define when you're talking about the US Treasury market. I mean, there aren't a whole lot of people in the world who have an interest in that blowing up. Um, you know, maybe some accelerationist, catastrophic kind of radicals, but like no one else does. Um, so that the politics of that are real, uh, uh, but that's how I would think of this. And that is very dynamic, it's very interesting. And that to me is one of the things that's become so wildly exciting about economics right now is that it isn't any longer in those neat boxes of the heterodox people here and the, you know, the Straffian Keynesian in one box or the Marxian Keynesian as other. We, we seem to me so past that, um, that conversation. It's one of my reservations about MMT that for me, it has too much of that, of that old sectarian quality to it, but that's a, another, another game. Uh, your second question was uh, a crisis. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. I was playing completely fast and loose with it. Um, um, and, and, you know, there is after all, going all the way back to Koselec, a, you know, quite a powerful critique of modernity's addiction to this talk um, as a way of organizing our reality. And I was sort of maneuvering my way very, very loosely around that. Um, I think I, you know, if, if you ask me what I meant in relation to the Bretton Woods system, I'd simply tell you that what I meant was the period in which it could smoothly operate, even with capital flow restrictions under the regime of, uh, designed in 44 was incredibly brief. Uh, periods before that, when you were tempted to do it, produced manifest flagrant classic balance of payments crisis like Britain in 47. Even when you were operating it, they were constantly having, you could tell, you could the pressure they were under because they were constantly having to innovate new tools to manage it. And out the other side, we know it blows up. So if you ask me what I mean by a crisis within a currency system, I think it's relatively easy to be precise. Um, at a broader level, I was using metaphorically because I think when we construct these these boxes like the you know post-war growth or the you know the golden age, and of course I have a you know this is a critical impetus against so much of social critical social theory, which is anchored in that as the norm. That is what we can no longer attain, and that sadness, the mourning of the loss of the fifties and sixties, is what drives the entire theorizing, right? And that, that has a right-wing version, which is make America great again, but it also has a left-wing version. And, and, and both of them are framed by this, this assumption that there was something there that was stable. And there was also agency. One of the beauties, this goes back to your other point, like uh, the paradigm breaking and the establishing of order against which crises can then neatly define are also satisfying because they imply agency, quite heroic agency. 
on the part, largely speaking, of a group of men, not exclusively, Jane Robinson was a key figure, but, but nevertheless, it's a kind of fairly classic vision of how history is made by great moments of agency. And that may be true some of the time. You know, I'm an addict to military history. There are key moments in military history which clearly have that kind of profile to them. But that doesn't seem to me a good way of describing how the post-war monetary system came into being or therefore what happens after it. So once you've redefined the order, you also redefine what the crisis is. Thanks. Um, I would, yeah, move over to, to the next question. Um, we will still um, go to a little bit of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, um, we might get uh, something on the decolonized perspective, but the next question um, would still be uh, in the area of macrofinance and Andreas, uh, who's also part of the Summer Academy as a lecturer for sustainable finance, started this uh, with a great topic already. Um, Fiona, uh, are you there? Would you like to ask a question yourself? Hey. Oh, I see hey, you. Can yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me as well? Yep. Okay. Um, thanks for the lecture. And uh, the question I have, like, if I understood it uh, correctly, crisis in which government bonds suddenly become less valuable because investors need liquidity are inherent mm. in our current financial system. And this forces central banks to implement these instruments they actually use right now. So, and yep. as you have explained, and they have very strong impacts on like inequality and also on climate crisis, like the recent uh, Greenpeace campaign uh, showed. And um, how how could we break this vicious circle? Uh, is there like one possibility by changing uh, central banks' mandates so mm -hmm. that they? absorb the negative effects of their own instruments um, or yeah and if so how can we guarantee democratic accountability of central banks if they have that much power and mm -hmm. I mean the instruments they use it's so yeah crazy what they can do and or would the answer be we have to transform the financial system so that central banks are not forced to use those in, uh, instruments Yeah, so the current situation we're in is really is really interesting, as I was really talking about with the JP Morgan guy, is that, is that um, we really de-risk the banks, and we did that very successfully. There hasn't been a banking failure this time around, and they are really difficult to handle because that's a lot of bad balance sheet all at once. Lehman was 600 billion in one fell swoop. Like, that's the size of the Greek debt pile twice over. Like, so these are, that's a very difficult Uh, domino to stop. When that can't starts coming down, it's really difficult to, to handle it. So they successfully managed to take the risk out of those. But what the effect was that as soon as that bond market panic started, the central bank needed to step in. Um, and we have to get comfortable with that if we want to take the banks, the big banks out as managers of that first layer of risk. And, and I think there's every argument for doing that, but we should be for, for, for transferring that risk that way. But we need to be very clear about the fact that that means that the trigger, the hurdle, the threshold for central bank involvement falls. Um, and so the step, the step comes quicker. That then does, I think, uh, pose the question really of what it is that we want the central banks to do other than simply stabilize the situation. And then I agree that it poses the question of how we legitimate them. And I just think the shortcut to both answering both questions is incredibly unpalatable, especially in the Euro context, but it's a way forward. I don't know whether it's a politically satisfying answer, but it's a logically satisfying answer, which is to say we need to pose the question of the mandate precisely because at the moment at which we pose the question of the mandate, democratic accountability, that's the ultimate moment of democratic accountability. Because presumably we see some virtue in independence which means we don't want to interfere with them all the time and make them answerable to, I don't know, AFD motions in the Bundestag. I don't want European monetary policy being made answerable to AFD motions in the Bundestag. Having AFD motions go to the German Constitutional Court was quite bad enough. I certainly don't want you know, the ECB having to answer them to Parliament. So, so, um, so independence may have a value, but clearly if we give them a huge remit, which we might be tempted to do, we also need to establish this check And, and it seems to me that a periodic revision, uh, the Pogosivus Centrum made this suggestion some while back, I've made the suggestion, we should break open the taboo around talking about the mandate. And once you do that, you achieve not just accountability, because that's so, that's so um, neat. What we need to do is achieve politicization. 
But then what we need to do is we need to make damn sure that we win the politicization, right? This is the point I was making. It's all very well for us to assert that agency is good and democratic control is good. Just so long as you're assuming that the balance of political forces is going to go the progressive way, assuming there are urgent problems. If you're, all you're doing is drawing up a pluralist constitution, you might be happy to say, well, the conservatives can have their turn. But if they're climate denying world ruiners, we only have 12 years. We don't have time for them to be messing around. So if we feel that the consensus, as it were, will enable a politicization which is dynamizing rather than creating a logjam where we have, you know, the frugal four or whatever holding us to ransom over this, that or the other. Um, the, the, the logic, I think, is quite clear cut. And, but it's a, it's a profoundly difficult and problematic tactical judgment, which I'm in no way, you know, qualified or placed to make, which is whether you could pull this off. Could we actually pull off a mandate renegotiation? The alternative, and the Americans are more, you know, the, the Americans are so much more fortunate about this, is that America has a dual mandate. And the dual mandate, you know, despite the fact that that's supposed to be taboo and is bound to cause inflation of these slides and it can't possibly work, the most important central bank in the world operates under a dual mandate. And one is inflation stability. They all effectively operate really under another one, which is financial stability. So really the Americans have three because the third is maximum employment, it's Humphrey Hawkins. And the genesis of Humphrey Hawkins is fascinating because it's actually a legacy of the late civil rights movement that says who benefits most or rather who is most disadvantaged by high unemployment. You may be running your Phillips curve thing, but it's after holding inflation. So this is completely unacceptable. So Coretta Scott King was running this campaign for a full employment guarantee precisely because racial disadvantage and in labor market disadvantage in a country like America are, are not, they're not separable. The unemployed are people of color. And in this crisis too, it's Latinx women who are most directly affected by this shock. So they are very closely entangled. And, and uh, but once you've got, once you've got that, second, that second leg, you can suddenly start discussing a whole variety of different issues, notably inequality in a way that you couldn't do before. Again, this isn't, this isn't a panacea, this isn't a magic bullet, because we know perfectly well Paul Volcker was equipped with a dual mandate. And did he give a damn about unemployment? Obviously not, he prioritized inflation, but it opens the door to a politics of pressure, which the ECB, you know, has tightly shut as possible. And it was designed to be that way. And what we're seeing now is this endless effort to find ways of incorporating other objectives within the mandate. I think it's it's politically, well, it's it's a very nice, fine political judgment, whether that's really the way to go. The 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 radical liberal in me thinks it's terrible. You know, this is a denial of politics and, and a series of legal subterfuges. But yes, broadly speaking, I think the way to solve it is to go for mandate change and then force. But that commits the left. If you do that, you're jumping off the cliff. So you better discover that you can hang glide. Like if you if you go over there, you better be sure that your parachute or whatever it is is going to save you because you are going over a cliff because the right is already politicizing monetary policy. Mm especially in Germany. So you could take the position we shouldn't, we should politicize too, or you should take the position that we should retreat to independence because that's the safe place from which to ward off the right. But it's a tactical judgment in any case. Thank you, thank you again. Um, a very important political question, I guess us as economists also have the responsibility to yeah, make this easily explainable um, to, to, to more people. At the very least, so that yeah. To, yeah. to understand this very important question, um, I would, yeah, move um, a little bit further and um, take a, a non-Western perspective. Um, um, I would ask Bea, maybe she wants to ask uh, her question, Beatrice. Okay. Great. Hello. Um, uh. Well, it, it has to do with the second aspect uh, in which you said 2020 crisis were, uh, was different. The where are you speaking of... from? Sorry. Can you tell me where you're speaking from? If this is a... Chile. Chile. Chile? Chile, Chile, right? Yeah, Chile. Yeah, Chile. I've got, yeah, okay. I've got. <laughs> Chile. Chile. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask my question. It's about the second shift in, uh, that you that you said uh, this crisis had. That's the collapse of, pol of policy paradigm. Okay. Uh, well, we can see uh, that the response of governments and central banks uh, varies across the world. In particular, developed economies uh, had financed huge fiscal pro pro programs, engaging in lots of public debt. Also, their central banks are injecting lots of money through quantitative easing and so. Uh, even we have uh, central banks that are changing the rules in, in which they work, uh, developing more and more uh, instruments. For example, the New Zealand's bank uh, changed its law and now has incorporated the objective uh, of unemployment uh, 
the, uh, the dual uh, objective of the bank of the central bank. But on the other on the other hand, we have that poor and developing countries have a limit in their public debt uh, that's uh, almost forty percent. Uh, no one uh, no one uh, can afford more than that, and and also uh, they can afford to make changes in their very classical monetary policy in much of, of our countries because we're afraid of the punishment of capital living. And that's like a huge conversation. Uh, and so uh, my question is, uh, maybe in the developed countries, uh, you have that, that the administration of the crisis reflects a collapse in the policy paradigm. Mm. But, uh, but I think in the poorer countries, we don't see that. Uh, it's, it's never even discussed in the public debate. Uh, uh, so I, I, I just wanted to ask you if you see it other way in, in that countries, this policy paradigm, shift or, or it's not and it's like a, a change that is happening in the developed economies and we are like maybe getting into it uh, a lot of years later that was thank you question. no that's a that's a really great perspective and I, I i do apologize for the for the essentially european american perspective of the paper I've, I've written quite a lot in the crisis about the emerging markets crisis um so uh, i i agree that this is an absolutely neurologic issue this is where the most people in the world live um and it is also, of course, the zone of uh, most rapid growth in recent years. So this is uh, both from the perspective of a humanism and from the perspective, if you like, of the future of global capitalism. That's really where the questions have to be asked. Uh, and Chile is a, is a fascinating uh, case. Um, I think, I mean, I would be, I would not for a second deny the hierarchical difference that you refer to. Um, it's, it's evidently the case. And we saw in February, March, April, the largest outflow of funds from the emerging markets that we have ever seen. Uh, it was comprehensive. Um, so it wasn't selective. Um, it was coming out of all of the emerging markets. It triggered a wave of campaigning mobilization. I was writing papers, everyone I know that was, you know, was writing papers ahead of the spring meetings of the IMF saying something needs to be done uh, to prevent a disaster. Um, and um, of course, uh, some countries, uh, Ecuador, Lebanon, um, Argentina, have tipped over the edge into default. Uh, there are a long list of other potential candidates over the rest of this year, and some of them in much, much worse underlying shape than any of those three that have gone first. Ecuador is obviously not a rich country at all, but there are bona fide low-income countries, a large number of um, sub-Saharan African countries which face crippling problems going forward from here. And that problem had already started last year. So this isn't an effect merely of COVID. Uh, half, I think, of the low-income frontier market borrowers were already in debt distressed conditions in 2019. So this problem is, has been burning for some time. Um, so I, I would recognize all of that. Um, uh, to my mind, perhaps the neuralgic question here is South Africa, uh, which, which is you know, facing a major epidemic, has one of the most unequal societies in the world. Um, even by the standards of Latin America unequal. Um, an unemployment rate which may hit 50% by the end of the year, started the year at 30%, um, downgraded from investment grade over the course of the year, suffered a huge loss to its currency. Really, you know, a potential massive crisis uh, and a power utility if we're thinking about green policy, ESCOM, which is one of the great disasters of global energy policy, uh, literally a kind of doom loop. Um, in the energy sector because it cuts off supply to municipalities and then they can't function economically. They can't pay ESCOM, so ESCOM debt's not good and it owes a lot of foreign currency denominated debt. So yes, this panorama is absolutely right. And Chile, Chile is kind of a liminal case, right? Because as you know, I don't need to tell you, it's actually for a complex, very ambiguous history. It has one of the higher levels of GDP per capita in Latin America. It's widely touted and treated by foreign investors as a model case. Your government has in fact spent rather liberally by the standards of share of GDP, even if it is a huge struggle to actually deliver that to people across the country. And it has been the source, as you know, of like waves of protest through by various groups making claims to that package. I think in total, it comes to over 10% of GDP now in terms of the fiscal package. And if, I, if I'm not wrong, poorly informed. And that for me is a real telltale sign. And this was already the case in 08, 09 which is that our categories of uh, empowered and disempowered states are in flux. And it is really a profound mistake to think of, you know, everything outside the advanced economy core or outside the OECD as belonging in one category. 
Um, because what happened from April is that what we've seen, as I was highlighting, is differentiation. And the weak countries have found themselves sliding ever more into unsustainable positions. And the stronger emerging markets have done things we've never seen them do before. Uh, not only are they borrowing in on a very large scale in their own currency, that's not a panacea because if foreign investors are borrow lending you the money in your own currency, you're still subject to runs, but it's a historic step, unthinkable in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. They are doing um, uh, very expansive fiscal policy. Uh, you know, several of the Asian uh, emerging economies are doing fiscal boosts over 10%. They're larger, for instance, than some of the European countries. Mexico is probably the standout case of a substantial emerging market with no major stimulus. India, you could cite as well. But most major emerging markets have done fiscal stimulus. Um, they've even done QE, not QE on the scale that uh, advanced economies have, admittedly, but they have lowered interest rates in the face of the storm, which is the reverse of what you would normally expect, where you expect interest rates to go up. And they have, in fact, engaged in a domestic bond, uh, domestic uh, bond buying to stabilize an outflow, which is the sort of behavior which we thought was a category mistake. That's what advanced economies central banks can do. That's why we call them advanced economy. And all of a sudden, the Indonesian central bank, almost all the central banks, I believe even the Chilean central bank, have been buying local currency bonds to stabilize the bond. Why shouldn't they? They're central banks. These are local currency bonds. You can trade them for local currency. There's no, there's no handicap here. South Africa has done it to a modest extent. Um, and, and so this doesn't establish parity. This doesn't mean that they're in the same league. This doesn't mean that they're included in the swap line network, for instance, unless you're Brazil, Mexico and South Korea. The South Korea hardly, why is it even treated in this category? But it does continue to be conventionally. But for instance, the IMF facilities that have been made available are completely unlike earlier IMF facilities. You know, Mexico pays like an annual fee of, I think, $170 million for a 25 billion credit line that it can pull down at the exchange of an email. So there is a change, right? These are, these are not the structural adjustment programs of old. Now, does that mean that hierarchy is gone? No, because it's still an IMF program. Um, but the terms have shifted, and I think they've shifted in at least three ways that I can think of. A, there's actually been economic growth. Chile has seen dramatic increase in GDP per capita. So these are not immiserated societies that they would have been 20 years ago, even though the problem of absolute poverty in Latin America is incredibly real. The malnutrition is gonna be a huge problem later this year. Still not at the same level we were 20 years ago. So that gives you a cushion. Secondly, there has been very substantial internal domestic sovereignty oriented strengthening and thirdly, ever since 2008, really, the dogma has really fragmented. No one's really going to come along and tell you you can't do QE because you are Chile. They're not going to come along and say you can't do intrusive macroprudential regulation of your banking system because we want absolute freedom of movement. They're not even going to say you can't do capital controls. We know. I mean, that argument was had out. Brazil won it for the emerging market world generally, right? They, they do hyper sophisticated management of their exchange rates using all sorts of complicated forward contracts. Um, you know, and again, Mexico is a bit of a pioneer. Mexico hedges a huge part of its oil revenue every year. It's the largest single hedgage deal in the commodity market in the world. And if you're offering to do that kind of deal, of course it costs you because it's insurance, but then it would cost Exxon too. But if you're, if you're Mexico and you're coming in, you get the best legal advice there is in North America. You get the top tier treatment by the investment bankers because you, you are a highly competent actor. You control one side of the information flow and you want a hedge that's going to pay out premiums of like $3 billion. So yeah, people will come along and provide you with top quality service. So you are armored up. You know these, they, they have all of the expertise in the financial world at their disposal when they make those kind of plays. Is it expensive? Yes. You know, if you were an absolutely robust advanced economy with a highly diversified economy, would you need to hedge your oil revenue flow? No. But do you attain a degree of control over your circumstances by doing so? Evidently, yes. And that, I think, is the reality that we have to deal with now. And as a historian, it's very important to register those shifts. And, the, you know, for me, like, you know, if you were going to form a kind of loose formula, it would be kind of like Beijing light. No one's going to say it out loud that it's the Beijing consensus. But these are the sorts of instruments that China has used and the successful Asian economies have used, and everyone has begun to use them. And because the advanced economies themselves are in this like gray zone, you know, they don't really have a position from which to strongly criticize these kind of moves. Um, again, to reemphasize, none of this means it's a flat world. Um, 
but it certainly has blurred the relationship between debtors and creditors, between powered and disempowered and empowered. It's a, it's a much more complex picture. And, and I, as I said, if the bond market is the ultimate test, if you are a well-placed EM right now, you borrow at historically low interest rates. You know, and if you've got highly competent you know, debt managers, like many of these treasuries have, you can, you can, you can, you can lock that in for eternity. Um, so there's a huge opportunity right now. And the conditions for that are, I mean, uh, so let me add one fourth dimension, is actual action, right? So the IMF programs help, the swap lines help, but above all, the Fed just swamping the world with dollar liquidity changes the game for everyone. So the real panic, I think, was the combination of bond market flight and the dollar surging. And if you, you don't have to be a you know, be a country which has borrowed a lot of dollars from foreign investors to feel the squeeze if the dollar surges, um, because your privates have all borrowed in dollars probably, even if your public sector hasn't. So um, that turning the dollar down um, from the last week of March by just limitless liquidity has changed the game for everyone. That is a relationship of dependence. It's a relationship of hierarchy. The decision-making autonomy was with the Fed, but when they pulled that switch, it changed the conditions for everyone else. Thank you Thank again. You, Thank you, Bea, also for the question. Um, we are running a little bit out of time, so um, let me just say that you have answered definitely um, the question that we posed in the beginning. I would have maybe gone back to it, but um, I think the major thing that we can take with us definitely is, as you also shown on your last answer, the complexity. And I want to encourage us as the Summer Academy, which is also still uh, running for two days, it's not over today, um, we have presentations on Sunday and so on that we, yeah, digest, uh, maybe have a look at some of these points. Again, the macro finance perspective is uh, important for, for all of our um, workshops as well, because um, yeah, you've described it, I think, very well how how the world is running, if you want to say it in this way. So, um, yeah, first of all, thank you to, to you, Adam. Um, well, thank you. Um, amazing. I think um, I want to, at this point, because we are running out of time, also thank um, at the same level, even almost the team uh, here at the Summer Academy. Some of them are on the panel. I don't know if they have their cameras still on. Um, no. <laughs> okay, it was on purpose. Um, and uh, of course, thanks uh, to the people that supported the Summer Academy. Um, oh, Holger's there. And um, yeah, we I actually already asked our team to, to take the other questions from the Q&A um, to record them because um, yeah, I think we have we've started this conversation, but uh, some of these questions we, we couldn't touch yet and might make sense to, to talk more in uh, some of our spaces that we have in the, in the internet in the moment, our open space uh, meeting rooms or something like this. So, um, yeah, I don't want to take any much more of your time. Um, thank you. Um, thank you. And yes, uh, hope to see you again. Um, and to our guests, I hope to see you maybe at uh, another summer academy, offline or online next year for pluralist economics. Great. Cheers. Bye -bye. Cheers. There you go.